When I was a little child, 13 years old, I had a tremendous passion for God and for Jesus. And my mother and my stepfather, particularly my mother, because she's the one that cared the most. My mother really tried to dissuade me from going to the Assembly of God Church. And, but I had my little Bible that I slept with every night in my room. It was a white zip-up Bible. And I had learned um, in school that year how to make uh, diagrams. And I, I don't know if modern education still teaches it, but you probably learned it on a computer. Back then we had to do this diagram. And I had done some interesting things. I had started reading the Bible and had read it completely through when I was 13 years old. And I made a lot of questions I wanted to ask my Sunday school teacher. <laughs> well, I made the diagrams off of the genealogy of Jesus. Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John. And I did the, and they didn't match. And so I had this composition of some questions that I wanted to ask Brother McClendon. That was our preacher. But I could only ask my Sunday school teacher. And one of them was, <clears throat> who did Adam and Eve's children, Cain and Abel, marry? You know, Mary. They went to the church, they got married. Who did they marry? Uh, that was not accepted as a good question. <laughs> but 13-year-old mind, I want to know if Adam and Eve were the first people that were ever created by God, and the only two children they had were boys. <laughs> Who did they marry? <laughs> My Sunday school teacher got very uncomfortable in her hosiery. <laughs> My next, she couldn't answer that. My next question was, is I had this real, real grief about Lot, that scumbag, <laughs> and that after Sodom and Gomorrah had been destroyed, you know, they, and his wife was turned into a vapor by that beloved Jehovah, that <clears throat> they ran off to this cave and he goes to bed with his daughters so they can have children. And I thought, you know, this is just smelling a little bad here. <laughs> and then there came Abraham. Now, these are the patriarchs of the Bible that are supposed to be the elect of God. And I really thought Abraham was all right. And, and until he brought his wife Sarah into this kingdom, and this king was really, you know, kind of dig in her chili. And uh, so Abraham says, oh, you can have her. It's, she's my sister. Well, this was his wife. And I thought, well, there he's gone and lied and given his wife up because he's such a chicken liver that he doesn't want to fight this king. Well, I'm getting very upset. So needless to say, my Sunday school teacher hadn't read these things either. And she couldn't answer anything. And then perhaps the, 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 the thing that really ended it is when I drug out my little diagram sheets of Jesus' genealogy. And I said, we may have a problem here because none of these match. At which point she took them from me and then scolded me and said, mysterious are the ways of God and we as sinners cannot question it. Well, I already had a little beef because they kicked my sister-in-law out of church because she wore a little tiny bit of lipstick because makeup was forbidden. And she wore a little tiny bit of lipstick to get my brother to come to church. And they made a big spectacle of it. And of course, my brother never came back. And they kicked my sister-in-law out. And at 13 years old, uh, with my passion, I couldn't figure out how a god that had <clears throat> uplifted all these crooks in the Bible. <laughs> you know, and, and Jehovah regularly slaughtering people of the lands he was taking these people into. 
I couldn't justify God's love that he could do all of those things and then banish my sister-in-law to hell forever for wearing lipstick. So I quit the church when I was 13 years old and my greatest supporter was my mother. But needless to say, I never stopped loving God and I was, was, had a guilt trip going on about Jesus, you know, and Jesus died for my sin. As far as I knew, I didn't know I had any sins. And how could this person 2,000 years ago die for me? And then the other question is, well, what about all the other people that lived before Jesus? And where do they go? Well, <clears throat> I have this passion all of my life. And I was a homely child. I was not the darling in my family. But I loved God. And I set out on an adventure with the mind that wanted to answer all these questions. So needless to say, when Rampa appeared in my life, maybe I was so open-minded but still had the love intact that there was room room in my life for such a great and awesome teacher. This passion continued on, and I got a hold of a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail, and I must have bought 200 of those, given them to people, and I don't, I don't know. I think there's one person that I gave them to that read the whole book. I thought it was one of the greatest books I'd ever read, and then I came across this book. Bloodline of the Holy Grail by Sir Lawrence Gardner. Well, I didn't know who Sir Lawrence Gardner was, except that when I opened this up, I read it in about four days' time because it was addressing the mysteries in my life, addressing them historically, and all of the lies that I had been told, and countless millions have been told. And I had to meet this man. This is, one of, this is the greatest book I have read that explains all of the loose ends in Christianity and the problems that the world still suffers today under the confines of the embittered religious wars. It answers them. So we got Sir Lawrence Gardner here. I just adore him. I adore him because he is open-minded. He's not guessing that this is the truth. He has found it. He has it historical information that was there hundreds of years before the birth of Christ. He's found the information. He wrote this book not off guesswork, but off real knowledge. And the reason that I wanted him to come to us and to address us, because I think except for the children, that perhaps most people my age in this audience do suffer from some sort of inadequacy, uh, an inadequacy that God lives outside of us and that we should be ashamed that we're a human being, even though we can't help it. And that this book addresses the cover-up that happened and the conspiracy that happened to not to free us to the kingdom of heaven, but to enslave us. And that's where Christianity is today. It is an enslaving doctrine. And anyone that is a Christian, God forbid, they never go outside of that little box of acceptability. And they never look to find answers. I had to find answers. And today you're going to hear from my favorite speaker that has ever come here, who has work that is not guesswork or hypotheses, but it is work that is based on historical information. And Lawrence Gardner is as open as they get. He had to be to have written a book about Jesus and his brother James bearing children. That's pretty open-mindedness. So it is with great pleasure that I introduce to you and hope that all of you pay close attention to my friend, Sir Lawrence Gardner.
Am I working? Yeah, I'm on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, I think actually this is the first time I've spoken here with the sun up, and I'm not sure how wise that is for a vampire, but um, <laughs> if I collapse into a heap of dust, you'll know it wasn't a good move. There's a lot of questions, you know, that, that turn up um, fro from Bible scripture. Jay-Z mentioned one just now about the Cain and Abel thing. We can go back right to the beginning of the the Bible stories, and, and, and as she correctly said, you know, nobody really poses the questions, who on earth did Cain, Abel marry? Um, it, it's said that, that Cain married, it gives us a list of some of his children and tells a story, but prior to that we have this other strange story about the fact that Cain slew Abel, killed him in the field and left him in a pool of blood. Now these are the only people on earth at the time. And, and so what Jehovah does, according to the text, is that he gets a little bit bothered about this and puts a mark on Cain in case all the other people might want to kill him. <laughs> well, one might ask, who? What other people? <laughs> so the anomalies are there. And it's these anomalies that really led to my my second book in this particular series which looks at the Old Testament in the same way that Bloodline looks at the New Testament. The, the trick with writing something like this is that one has to get beyond the scripture itself. One has to get to the books that weren't included, the, the books that weren't approved for the, for the canon of the whole thing. And there are many of them that, that actually were not selected for the Old Testament just like there are with the New Testament. What you have to realize is that the Old Testament was written to do a specific job. What surprised me in the course of this late investigation is that the selections, the manipulation, and the corruptions within the Old Testament choosing of scripts and texts was greater than it was with the New Testament. And more changes made. Now, I'm not going to talk about Adam and Eve and Cain and all of this early stuff tonight, particularly because um, I, I spoke at, at some length about it last time I was here. Some of you may have been at that lecture, some of you weren't. There were various aspects of it which I shall cover again, but I'm going to come at them from a different angle. As far as the early stuff goes, that the sort of the, 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 the building up of the human race on earth as we know it today, you've got somebody else coming later on to talk about that part of it. So there's not much point in me crossing over with that. Last October I did speak here about a mysterious substance which the ancient people of Mesopotamia used to call starfire. And in fact, following that, I've had quite a number of letters from, from people here that, that heard it, um, asking some, some pr pr pretty good questions. So I'll cover that again a little bit, but I'm going to come at it from, from a different angle. And... Um, go backwards to it rather than coming forwards to it this time. I'm going to sort of leap forward into the time of Moses and others and go back into to that part of history so that we can see how things came together. Now to put things into perspective, just about everything that we now know today about life and times of those old, old BC years, we've actually learnt onwards from the late 1800s, within the last 100, 150 years or so. Prior to that, the Old Testament that we have was one of the very few documents of records that, that gave us this story in any way whatsoever. The Old Testament was never written to be history. The Old Testament was put together as a book of scripture. It was designed to underpin a growing religious establishment in, in the BC years, about 500, 600 BC, that sort of era. So although it was telling stories about things that happened thousands of years before that, it was designed to do a job only about 500 years before the time of Jesus. It was the building up of, of the Jewish Hebrew religion. To a large extent, these writings were, were based on mythology. Um, they weren't meant to be history. 
But for the longest time, we've treated them as if they were history. One can't blame our forebears for doing this because there was nothing to compare. There were no other records available, just the Old Testament. So it became fact, it became dogma, it became absolute, and to challenge it was um, in some way or other regarded as heretical. The mythology became designated history. Our governing and educational establishments told us it was history, and our schools and churches have taught us that for the longest time. But now we're better informed. During this century and just a little before, tens and tens of thousands of old documents have been unearthed. They're on stone, they're on clay, they're on parchment, they're on papyrus. And they tell the whole story that we know from the Bible, but they tell it in a very, very different way. When these things were discovered and translated into English and other Western languages in the 1920s, 1930s, one would expect, as with scientific and medical discoveries, that everybody would be really excited about this. At last we've got some information, at last we're going to learn the truth about some of these characters who, although enigmatic, actually have no real purpose, it seems, in history, apart from being wandering nomads of one sort or another. But that wasn't the case. The enthusiasm wasn't there at all. The academic establishment felt threatened by it. And it's very easy to understand why, because it contradicted everything that they themselves had written to prove that they were the experts. <laughs> These writings from four, three, two thousand, one thousand years ago, first-hand writings are the writings of kings, of queens, of priests and chancellors, of city governors, state officials, scribes, historians, astronomers, archivists, military commanders, teachers, they're all there. Even farm workers and mine workers wrote these documents. But they are all people who wrote mythology, we're told. It seems rather odd, doesn't it, that, that everybody alive at a particular period in time was, was, was writing fairy tale and, and <laughs> fabricated folklore. I think I'll write up the records of my mind working today. It'll be mythology. <laughs> so that's what we're led to believe, that, that this is the case. You know, this is not history at all. 2,000 years ago, they dug up some huge bones in China, massive bones, and they didn't know what the hell they were. They figured that they must be the bones of a dragon. It was said that, that in ancient proto-historic times, the the tail of a great dragon had carved the river channels through the earth of China, enabling the water to flow out to the sea. So this was a dragon. They had found the bones. Well, it wasn't until the 1820s, it's not like that long ago, that very similar bones were found. And following that, these bones were found in various parts of the world. And 170 years ago, we discovered dinosaurs. We named them dinosaur, dinosaurus, terrible lizard. These were exactly the bones that the Chinese had found 2,000 years ago. Through that same 2,000 years, the Old Testament has actually been the equivalent of this Chinese dragon. It's been the only record that we had, and so we had to decide that it was the positive fact. We called it a dragon, we called it history. Between the 1850s and the 1930s, documents were unearthed in the Holy Land, in Syria, in Mesopotamia. And the intriguing thing about these documents was that they started to give us the names of the people that we know. Abraham, Esau, Israel, Heber, Nahor, Terah, all of these names actually cropped up on documents. So the first thing that we learned was that, that actually the Bible had got a certain amount of it right. These characters were real, they actually existed. What we learned also was that they weren't just the names of people, that they were the names of cities, of states, of, of great towns and, and realms that were governed by, by municipal governors at the time. So we have a situation where we know that these people either gave their names to the cities or the cities took their names from their governors, but clearly they were, they were pretty important people. Now we don't have them given to us as pretty important people, we have them given to us as nomads, as wandering people. Um, tribesmen uh, for some sort. So, one by one these documents begin to give us a different story. 
what I tried to do was not, not to divert too much in, into just interesting realms for the sake of it, but to try and narrow it down and to keep the Old Testament in sight throughout. By the 1880s, the governing establishments of the West absolutely detested the word archaeologist. <laughs> it's not that long, it's only a hundred years ago. Archaeology was new, but they hated them. They hated them so much that new laws and regulations were, were brought into operation. Archaeological digs suddenly in Egypt and Mesopotamia had to be approved and they could only be funded from certain sources and these sources were controlled by a newly designated set of authorities. And one of these authorities was called the Egyptian Exploration Fund. That was founded in Britain in 19, 1891. On the very first page of the Articles of Association of the Egypt Exploration Fund, it said, the fund's objective is to promote excavation work for the purpose of elucidating or illustrating the Old Testament narrative. <laughs> what this meant was, in short, that if something was found by these archaeologists that could be used to support the scriptural teaching of the time, then we, the public, would be informed about it. Anything else was mythology. If it did not suit the interpretation, it was not destined to see the light of day in the public domain. That was a hundred years ago. We still suffer from many of these, these types of regulation today. There was a hell of a lot discovered out there in these countries that we don't get to hear about. It's put under wraps, it's kept in closeted rooms beneath the museums, but we don't get to learn the truth of it. So what we're going to do, I think, to, today really is just to, to look at one example of a particularly monumentous find of, of that era, of the late 18, uh, 1800s. We'll look at one particular discovery just to give you an idea of the sort of thing that has been veiled fr from us. In my opinion, this is probably the most important biblical discovery ever made. There is little, if anything, beyond academic and closeted circles that are written about it at all. Within the context of the book of Exodus, there's a significant mountain named in the Bible. It sits in the, the range of the Sinai Peninsula, which is an upturned triangle that, that's between um, Egypt and Jordan. It's firstly called Mount Horeb, it's secondly called Mount Sinai, it's then called Mount Horeb again, and that's the name that it sticks with as the story progresses. And the story, of course, is, is that of Moses bringing the Israelites out of Egypt, and, and they meet with Jehovah on the holy mountain of Horeb in Sinai. At the time of Moses, roughly 1360 BC, that sort of era, there actually was no mountain called Mount Sinai. We, we must know that at the outset. There wasn't even a mountain by that name in the time of Jesus, and not even for another three or four hundred years did Mount Sinai exist in geographical record. The translation of the Old Testament that we have today was compiled in a little before the year 1000. It is actually 600 years newer than the New Testament that we have today. So, giving places names that they knew about in the year 1000, when the Crusades were th thought about being launched and that sort of thing, they were giving places names that they knew at that time, not necessarily names that applied back in the time of Moses and the others, so that the people of that era would know exactly where they were talking about. Now, the mountain generally called Mount Sinai now sits in the south of that triangular peninsula, it was actually given its name and called Mount Sinai in the fourth century. A, a, a mission of Greek Christian monks decided to build a little mission there and they decided that this was Mount Sinai of the Bible. It's sometimes called Jebel Musa, which means Mount of Moses. And there's a, a small Christian retreat there today, it's called St. Catherine's Monastery. But was that the mountain that actually was the Mount Sinai of the Bible, or the Mount Horeb of the Bible? It transpires that it was not. 
Exodus actually goes to, to some lengths to explain to us exactly where this magical mountain was. The mountain that Moses and the Israelites went to on their way from Egypt across to the land of Midian. It tells us that they, they crossed the, the, the wilderness regions of Shur and, and Paran and, and they came to this mountain. Well, in actual fact, if one follows the route on the map, exactly the route that's given to us in Exodus, that they are hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the Mount Sinai that sits on our maps today. In fact, they travel so north across Sinai that they are within hundreds of miles of the Red Sea. They actually crossed the strip of land at the top where the, the Suez Canal sits today. So it um, seems rather strange that they should have diverted by hundreds of miles to, to, to cross the Red Sea at a point where Moses had to part the waters. Wasn't the case. They were very north of that, and it tells us where they went across there. It tells us exactly where Mount Horeb was. The word Horeb is a, an Arabic word. It simply means desert. Mount Horeb was desert mountain. And desert mountain is, is, is something which has been well known for a long, long time. And at the moment, this time and for, for the last, well, for this century, it's been called um, the mountain of Serabit, Serabit el Kadim, the prominence of the Kadim. This sits about 2,600 feet above sea level, exactly where Exodus tells us it was on the route from Egypt, the land of Goshen, across to the land of Midian. Well, in the late 1890s, the British Egyptologist Sir Flinders Petrie of the University College in London decided to apply to the Egyptian Exploration Fund for money to go and investigate this mountain. By 1904, he and the team were there. They were standing at the foot of Mount Serebit. And in the following year, Petrie published privately the results of their findings with photographs, records, and maps. But he added to his notes to this publication that the report that he made, despite its funding source, would not generally be made public by the Egyptian Exploration Fund. The subscribers to the fund would receive maps, they would receive little bits of information, but the detail of what they found would not be mentioned at all. The officers would simply tell even their own members what they wanted to tell from the results of Petrie's findings. Why? Had he in fact broken some regulation of, of the articles? Had he found something that he wasn't supposed to find? Well, that's exactly what had happened. He discovered the secret of this magical, sacred mountain of Moses. A secret which not only made absolute sense of the portrayals that we have in Exodus, but which blew the lid totally from the common scriptural interpretation of that story. Sinai was not a foreign land to the Egyptians. It was actually part of Egypt. It came under pharaonic control. So Moses and the Israelites, when they left Egypt and crossed into Sinai, were theoretically, for that moment in time, still in Egypt. Sinai came under the control of some particular public officials. One was called the Royal Chancellor, other was called the Royal Messenger, and these people governed Sinai. Moses' era was the era of Egypt's, Egypt's 18th dynasty, and in fact we know exactly who the governors of Sinai were in the 18th dynasty. We know their names, we know their families. The Royal Messenger was a guy called Nebi, and he was also mayor and troop commander in the set town of Zaru, which in fact was the chief town in Goshen where the Israelites had come from. It's where they spent their, their, their years in Egypt. The royal chancellor was held in, in the family of Pa-Nihas. Panahesi of this family was the official governor of Sinai at the time. The family of Panihas goes right back into the kingship of ancient Troy. It's, 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 it's a, a family that, that moves through kingship all the way through history. And at that time, Panihas was governing Canaan. The Bible calls him Phineas. So we, when we read about Phineas becoming one of the first pre priests of the Egyptian um, church, uh, of the Israelite church, this is Pani Has. This is the governor of Sinai, a very important man. Another thing to understand before we follow Petri into, into the discovery is that there was an immense difference at the time, although the Bible doesn't make it clear, between a group of people called Hebrews and a group of people called Israelites. 
They weren't the same thing at all. The Hebrews were the, the family descendants of Abraham. They were descendants of his line and in essence they lived in the land of Canaan and in Palestine. The Israelites were no more nor less than the descendants of one of Abraham's grandsons. This was the grandson called Jacob who changed his name to Israel, who took the family to Egypt where they spent many centuries before coming out with Moses. And these, this family were called Israelites, children of Israel, the founder of the family. So what we have to recognize about the story of the mountain of Moses is that when Moses came out of Egypt, he came out of Egypt with Israelites, not with Hebrews. The whole point of the story of the laws and the ordinances given at Mount Horeb, Mount Sinai, was really a part of bringing the Israelites back into the Hebrew community, a foreign land where they actually had to learn new rules, new regulations, new laws to be part of the family that they themselves originally grew from. So that's, that's kind of where it sits. Israelites were not Hebrews. In time to come, the word Jews comes up in history, Judeans. They weren't necessarily Hebrews or Israelites, they were simply people who lived in Judea. Today, all of these words get roped into one and they're, they're sort of one people. So the Israelites had spent something like 400 odd years living in a part of Egypt, up there in the Nile Delta, in the land of Goshen, the, the head city of which was Zaru. Through 400 years, having no contact personally, hardly at all, with their Hebrew relatives in Canaan, they grew up in a completely different environment. They grew up in an environment that didn't have this single Jehovah God as their God. They grew up in a country with a pantheon of gods. Um, it was the Egyptian law that they followed. However, being of the family that they were, they, they, they still hit upon the idea of following a kind of Hebrew concept and they, they had a one God concept among themselves in, in Goshen. And they simply called this God Lord, Adon, Adonai, my Lord. And this is one of the reasons why the names Lord and Jehovah crop up independently in the Bible. Uh, but we read them as if they're the, uh, talking about the same person. For the most part they're not. One God was the Lord, the other God was Jehovah. Jehovah was strictly for the Hebrews. To the Egyptians, the name Adon was pronounced Aten, A-T-E-N, and it's from that that we get the name of Pharaoh Akhenaten, servant of Aten. This was a one God concept which Akhenaten brought into Egypt at just before the time of Moses. So even Egypt had within that Goshen area this one God ideal. Across the water the Hebrews had the one God ideal, but it was a different God. So when Moses came into Sinai with, with the Israelites, they didn't arrive as worshippers of Jehovah when they got to this magic mountain. They were worshippers of Aten. And it was for this very reason, as I mentioned, that they were given a whole new set of laws and ordinances to comply with the Hebrew culture of their prospective new homeland. So back to Flinders Petrie. He goes to the mountain, and he knows that there's going to be something there. Quite how he knows, he doesn't explain, but he knows that this is the mountain and he knows that if he looks hard enough, he's going to find a secret there. Well, to start with, they found nothing very much at all. But on a wide plateau, very near the summit of this mountain, they found things that made them believe there had been habitation there. There were things around that looked like buildings sticking out of this plateau, 2,600 feet up a mountain. There were great pillars, standing stones, protruding out of a whole heap of rubble. So he decided to have a look and see what was underneath this rubble. This rubble had been deposited by winds and landslides over 3,000 years, but when it was finally moved away, Petri wrote at that time, there is no other monument known which makes us regret more that it is not in better preservation. The whole of this was buried, no one had any knowledge of it until we cleared the site. What they found high up on Mount Horeb, 2,000 feet above sea level, was an enormous Egyptian temple. 230 feet of it spread out above ground, 
another part of it spread out within a cave below ground, cut into the mountainside with, with, with short edges and polished sides. And the various inscriptions and cartouches around this temple and on the, the walls and the standing stones led him to discover that this had been an operative Egyptian temple right back to the time of the very first dynasty of Egypt. We're looking at Moses in the 18th dynasty of Egypt, so that's going back a long, long way, and this temple had been operative all, the, all through that time, 3000 BC. The above ground part of the temple was, was mostly sandstone, quarried from the mountain itself. It comprised a series of halls and corridors, shrines, cubicles, chambers, and of these, the, the, the features that, that are now open for inspection are the main sanctuary, the Shrine of Kings, the Portico Court. These are big. Um, the Hall of the Goddess Hathor. The whole of this temple complex that Moses took the Israelites to, where they apparently met with Jehovah to receive the Ten Commandments and the new ordinances, was a temple of the Goddess Hathor. She appears on reliefs all around the place. The cave would cut into the rock is dedicated to Hathor. The walls that are smoothed and polished like marble have her pictures all over them. And yet this is supposed to be the magic mountain of Jehovah. Deep within the cave, Petri found a limestone standing stone of the Pharaoh Ramesses I. Now all of the experts today tell us that Ramesses was a hater of the Aten cult in Egypt. Not what Ramesses himself said. He describes himself with the title, I am Ramesses, I am the ruler of all that Aten embraces. So the experts are telling us untruths even today about what these pharaohs were about. Also found was a, a, a statue head of the mother of Moses within this temple. So it proved that not only had it been in constant use right back from about 3000 BC, even by the time that Moses got there in about 1330 BC, it was already being used in that recent period. It was constantly in use, this great temple. In the halls and the courts of the outer temple, there are stone tanks, rectangular basins and, and, and baths and all sorts of curiously shaped tables and benches that nobody could make any sense out of. They didn't look like altars. They had recessed fronts, they had split level surfaces and the whole thing reminded them more of a laboratory than it did of a temple. There were alabaster vases, there were containers and all these are shaped like lotus flowers and, 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 and things like that. There, there are all sorts of articles there. There were wands there, they called them wands, they were like little uh, um, priest sticks, and even today they can't quite work out what they're made of. The material is very, very hard. These things are all designed, but they're not designed in the normal Egyptian style. They have basket work, they have lattice work, they have a style of, of, of design that is more Mesopotamian than, is, than Egyptian, and yet this is an Egyptian temple. They also found a few other very strange things. When they move into the Hathor temple complex, which appears to be the central point at where all of the, this energy comes from, they begin to find some strange things. Conical stones set very carefully on a shelf, little cones of stone. A metallurgist's crucible was very apparent. Now these kind of things began to get Petri and his people wondering, well, what on earth had, had these things got to do with a temple? There was nothing in temple law that said that metallurgist crucibles were, were part of what went on. And all over the temple, all over the walls and on the various stones was something venerated, highly venerated within the temple complex and it was called mufkuts. Doesn't mean a lot to us today, mufkuts. Okay, mufkuts. They found 2,600 feet above sea level in the mountain of the Bible, conical stones, metallurgist crucibles, tanks, basins, lotus flower equipment, all sorts of wands and tubing that look like an laboratory, and references venerating some mysterious substance called mufkuts. Now, they knew that these things were all linked together, but they didn't know how. So they began to, to try and work out what on earth Mufkuts was. Some said it was probably copper. 
Many preferred the idea of turquoise. Others have supposed it was perhaps malachite. But the funny thing about these guesses was that none of these materials was apparent within the temple complex. There was no malachite, there was no turquoise, there was no copper. Sinai is noted for its turquoise mines, but if mining had been a primary function of that temple over two to three thousand years, you'd expect to find turquoise stones in the tombs of Egypt. There are barely any at all. So if they were working for three thousand years mining turquoise, they clearly only found about half a dozen. Copper, they said. Well, it didn't take them long to realize that if you were mining and smelting copper, um, you need very different equipment to this sort of equipment. This was, not, this was not metal rectification equipment in the way that they knew it. Copper was apparent in Sinai, but down in the deep valleys there were smelting works, old smelting works, and they were nothing like this temple at all. There was no residue of copper anywhere except references to Mufkut's. Another cause of wonderment as they traveled around this, as they kept removing all of this rubble, was that they kept seeing inscribed references to bread. Everywhere there were references to bread, and bread was always written alongside mufkuts. The other thing that happened all the time was that the, the most prominent of all the hieroglyphic signs outside that was the, the sign for light. Now, bread and light and mufkuts all seemed to be equally important within this temple complex. This was nothing to do with copper. It had something to do with these strange tanks, these strange laboratory tables with their recessed fronts and split-level surfaces. So, bread, mufkuts, light, conical stones, metallurgies, crucibles, all of these posed a problem until they decided to clear the rubble from a series of square storerooms in one of the parts of the temple. As they removed the rubble, they came across slabs of stone beneath the rubble. They moved the slabs of stone, and beneath these, carefully stored in every one of about four or five of these large square rooms, a few inches deep, packed tight on the floor, were tons and tons of the finest, purest, unadulterated white powder. So, said the experts, this is clearly the result of copper smelting. <laughs> so they did some copper smelting and discovered that what you actually get from copper smelting is a dense, black, filthy slag. You do not get white powder. There was no copper actually within miles of the mountain, even though copper exists in Sinai in, in abundance in some parts. Others said, this clearly was from the burning of plants to produce alkali. Quite why they would want to produce alkali, nobody really knew, but the more they tested it, the more they found that there was no plant residue there at all. And in fact, if they were going to have a temple for the burning of plants, they actually would have done better down in the valleys where there were more trees, not 2,600 feet up a mountain. So for want of any other explanation, it was decided that the white powder and the stones were perhaps associated with a sacrificial rite. They're clinging at straws here all the time, trying to work out what on earth this was. This is probably animal sacrifice. <laughs> well, as pointed out by somebody who wasn't even the brightest member of the team, this was an Egyptian temple. There is nothing anywhere in history which says that the Egyptians ever used animal sacrifice for anything. It wasn't part of their, their, their religious structure at all. They tested the powder, they winnowed it in the breeze, they did everything they could. There was not a bone, a chip, a stone, a piece of plant, a piece of skin, anything in this powder. And it was described as being hard-packed talcum powder which was impalpable to touch and just blew away in the breeze the moment you flicked it into the air. Petri wrote, though I searched these ashes in dozens of instances, winnowing them in a breeze, I never found a fragment of bone, skin, plant, or anything else. So some of the mysterious powder was sent back to Britain for analysis and examination. The results for what they were, were never actually published. 
When people went back to have a look at the rest of the powder, and they reckoned there was about 50 tons of this, it had all, of course, been left a victim to the desert winds and um, erosion and rainfall and whatever, and that was the end of that. What became apparent, however, when checking out other inscriptions at the temple was that this mufkuts, this powder, had something to do with what the Mesopotamians called highwood firestone. It's the same thing. Mufkuts turned out to be highwood firestone. They called it the sacred Shem Anna, from which derived, of course, the biblical word manna. And this is the importance of the word bread that kept appearing through the thing. There was some tie-up between this powder and, 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 the, and the Shem Anna of the, um, of the Mesopotamians. Light, the word light was always there. Whenever Shem Anna was mentioned, whenever Mufkuts or highwood firestone was mentioned, the symbol for light was always there alongside it. It was decided, and it turns out probably quite correctly, that this mufkut was exactly the same powder that the book of Exodus actually talks about. It tells us about powder. It tells us about the Israelites being fed with a particular powder at that time. It tells about the importance of manufacturing something called showbread for the tabernacle and, and, and the altar of the temple. Showbread is exactly the same as show manna, and Shem Anna is exactly what the Mesopotamians used to call it. It's the same thing. But the book of Exodus tells us that the guy who made the showbread for Moses' tabernacle was a guy called Bezalel. Now, Bezalel, it goes to great pains to tell us, was a goldsmith and a master craftsman. So this foe has got the instructions, and they're laid down in the Bible for us to read, to make candlesticks, to make golden bowls, to make platters, to make all the ornaments for the Ark of the Covenant, and to make this bread, the goldsmith. Master craftsman is a particularly important word, and the more I looked for this definition, master craftsman, the more I found going back and back and back in time. The definition exists way back to about 4000 BC. These were the great Vulcans, the texts tell us. The master craftsmen were the great Vulcans. They were the people in charge of the furnaces. They were the people who made the highwood firestone. So as for the crucible and the conical stones and the tanks and the tables and all of the equipment at Sinai, it was actually determined by the Petri team that this temple was clearly a laboratory. So the report went back to London, and I began by telling you what they didn't tell us. What they'd found was the alchemical workshop of the Pharaoh Akhenaten and of the 18 dynasties of pharaohs before him. A temple laboratory where the furnace smoked and roared just as the book of Exodus tells us in the production of the highwood firestone, the Shemana. And Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke because the Lord descended upon it in fire. The smoke ascended as the smoke of a furnace and the mountain quaked greatly. That's what it tells us. Prior to that, it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was dark, and behold, there was a smoking furnace, a burning lamp passed between the pieces. The burning bush seen by Moses, which was a fire, a blaze, exploded, but was not consumed, and an angel came out of it. If you think about it, it's pretty well identical to the experiment that David Hudson did with his pencil. The blaze of light, it had no effect on the object within it. It's the same story. In Exodus, we read that Moses took the golden calf. We're now on the mountain. The Israelites had made a golden calf. He burnt it in the fire and ground it to a powder. <laughs> now, nobody has actually queried these words, it seems to me, but if you burn gold in a fire, you get molten gold. You don't actually get powder. But it tells us that he burnt the gold in the fire and turned it into white powder. This was exactly the process of a Shemana furnace, as the Egyptian records tell us. And that's precisely what was going on at this temple. They were actually making this stuff. 50 tons of it. Moses' own great-grandfather was the pharaoh Tuthmosis III. 
Tasmothis III had reorganized the ancient mystery schools of Toth in Egypt and founded the Royal School of the Master Craftsmen at Karnak. At the time, they called them the Great White Brotherhood because of their preoccupation with a mysterious white powder. <laughs> a branch of the fraternity became known as the Therapeutate. They were a healing community, so this had something to do with medicine as well. The Therapeutate, in fact, set up branches all over Palestine and Syria, and they, a branch of, of that Therapeutate, were the Essenes at Qumran in the time of Jesus. So clearly, these guys were into this as well. Hathor. All of this is dedicated to Hathor, not to Jehovah. She was the great mother. She is the oldest identified deity figure of Egypt. She turns up on the oldest artifact ever known from 3000 odd BC. And her story, when it's being told in documented form, runs in parallel with a historical character called the great Vulcan, Tubal Cain. Now, Tubal Cain is actually mentioned in the Bible. Tubal Cain was um, one of the descendants of Cain in the line from Eve. Tubal Cain, even today, is revered by Freemasons worldwide. They don't know why, they just know that Tubal Cain was very important and that Tubal Cain was a master metallurgist. He was a great Vulcan. Now, Hathor is particularly interesting in Egypt because Hathor is not only there at the very beginning of Egyptian time, she's there at the very, very end of it. Right at the, the end of the Pharaonic era when Queen Cleopatra is sort of winding down the whole thing and the Romans are moving in and we're in about 30, 40 BC, she's the penultimate pharaoh of them all, makes sure that she has her one and only relief of her carved on the Temple of Hathor. Hathor was a nursing goddess. Hathor was said to be the daughter of Ra. She was said to have given birth to the sun. She was the queen of the west. She was the one who knew the right spells, whatever they were. She was the protectress of womanhood, the lady of the sycamore, wine, tombs, song. But the importance of Hathor was that it was from the powdered milk of Hathor that the pharaohs gained their divinity. Now, we know now what the powdered milk of Hathor was. It was the powder being manufactured at the Hathor temple. They wondered at the time why this would not have been done in Egypt. But as I said earlier, Sinai was Egypt. It was the same country. It just happened to be the other side of the water. Now, one of the, the, the rock carvings by the cave at, at, at the mountain is a representation of Moses' own great-grandfather, Tosmosis IV, in the presence of Hathor. And on this wonderful carved relief stands topped with lotus flowers and a man presenting Tosmosis with a loaf of white bread. A conical loaf of white bread. Another stella details the mason, Ankib, offering two conical bread cakes to the king. And there are portrayals of this all throughout this temple, these bread cakes, the importance of the muskuts, Hathor giving her divinity to the pharaoh. The man whose dynasty, and priests were dynastic as well as kings, the man whose dynasty went right through the, the government of this temple from the earliest times to the time even of Moses, Moses was a, a dynasty called Sobek Hotep. And Sobek Hotep is described as the overseer of the mountain and the overseer of the secrets of the house of gold. So there is no doubt whatever that we're dealing here with gold and everything pointed to it as far as Petri was concerned. But the Egypt Exploration Fund would have nothing to do with this. Reason being, that in telling that story, which was a much more exciting story, we were not telling the story of the Ten Commandments and Moses and Jehovah on the mountain that the Bible told. Irrespective of the fact that this explains it better, this explains why they ended up on a mountain hundreds of miles off route, it's still better for them not to tell the story. 
Hathor was portrayed particularly by the pharaohs of the fourth dynasty. When you see their pictures, these old kingdom pharaohs of, of, of the fourth dynasty, Hathor is always there beside them. The fourth dynasty was the great dynasty of pyramid building. Pyramid building was directly related to this temple and the house of gold. That's how they got their name. The word per, P-Y-R, means fire. Pyramid simply denotes something that is begotten by fire. Hathor is very important in the pyramid era. She's very important to the pharaohs of that era, the pharaohs that, that were said to have built the great pyramids of Giza. What, what was the link, I, I, I wondered. And I thought, well, I'm going to read these reports of Petri. So I actually managed to get the reports to, to find out what was going on here. And Petri was bothered by the same thing. He couldn't actually work out why, why this nursing goddess, this goddess whose milk gave the pharaoh's divinity, pharaoh's divinity, was associated with building pyramids. Well, the answer actually was very, very clear cut. Under the right circumstances, this powder is perfectly capable of transposing its own aspects to other things. This powder, if you remember, the, the Hudson experiments actually had its own weightlessness. It was exotic matter. Now, one of the great researchers into gravity from the 1960s was the Russian physicist, physicist Sarikov, Sakharov. And he, he, he wrote a lot about gravity at a zero point. And he said, this powder is exotic matter. He explained that it had, under testing, a gravitational attraction of less than zero. It weighed not only nothing, but this powder could weigh less than nothing. It's wholly exotic, he said. This powder can be made to move into a different dimension if we want it to. Not only can it itself weigh less than nothing, but its host can weigh less than nothing. Now, if you remember again the Hudson talks, remember the pan? The powder was in the pan. Not only did the powder lose its weightlessness, but so does the pan. So what emerges from this is that actually it doesn't matter whether it's a pan or a saucer or an enormous great block of stone. They tell us that these massive pyramid blocks, two and a half to 15 tons apiece, raised to great heights with accuracy that is beyond comprehension, with ramps and ropes and tens of thousands of slaves over an inordinate period of time. This is nonsense. Everybody's proved it's nonsense, and whenever they've tried to do it, it doesn't work. Well, tests by people like Sakharov and others have actually proved that the whole thing could have been much more simple. If they're producing Shimana, highwood firestone, at this temple to feed the light bodies of the pharaohs to, as the milk of Hathor to give them divinity and longevity, why is there 50 tons of it laying around? They don't actually need that much, but they were producing it in enormous quantity. Well, the speculation seems to have got to the point that this had a lot to do with pyramid building. Pyramids were fire begotten. They were made by the furnace. This stuff was made by the furnace. It's interesting also to note that, that this powder from whether it's Sakharov or Hudson or whoever did tests on it can actually be made physically to move into a different dimension and, and things that are within its hosting, that can happen too as well. These great pyramids of Giza were essentially, we're told, the burial places, the tombs of the old kingdom pharaohs. Well, every one that they opened up contained nothing but empty coffers, just granite, empty coffins. Not one body of these pharaohs has ever been found. But the interesting thing is, what they did find in these granite um, sarcophagi was a layer of white powder. So in fact, 
What now begins to emerge is that when one reads through the Egyptian Book of the Dead in the coffin text and talks about the Pharaoh's final journey, being held in this dimension to come back at another period in time, it rather seems as if that's precisely what they did. This, through the superconducting properties of this thing, they probably did exactly that. They simply suspended these guys in some animated form in a different dimension. So that at some stage in future time, the right wizard who knew the right spells could come back and the pharaohs would re-emerge. They hadn't bargained on the Egypt Exploration Fund <laughs> or the British Museum, whose people came along with dustpans and brushes and bags and swept up all this powder and chucked it away. So these pharaohs have got no chance. They're stuck there forever. <laughs> the King's Chamber David Hudson mentioned this in his talk. I hadn't really heard of this concept before I heard that, but I've worked on it a lot since because it really intrigued me. It does turn out to have probably been an enormous superconductor. The rite of passage of the pharaoh was conducted through that superconducting process, and clearly this holding the pharaoh in a different dimension does seem to have been what it was about. So you have this power to being important not only in the pharaoh's lifetimes for feeding to them, to give them longevity and divinity and all of those attributes. It was important in building their tombs, the pyramids themselves, and it was important to create a superconducting environment in which to preserve the bodies of those same pharaohs. And every time you move into documents that talk about any of these things, you see the same two symbols, bread and light. They turn up every single time. So let's have a look at Moses. We now have the root of a story. We know that these people came out of, Sin uh, uh, of Egypt. They moved into Sinai. They were Israelites. They went to an Egyptian temple, a temple that had been operative for two and a half thousand years. This was a laboratory station. Moses would have known it was there. Why on earth did they go there? Let's look at what the Bible tells us. Well, the person that they met there, of course, was Jehovah. And this is where the story begins to fall down, because at that stage, Moses even, isn't even quite sure who Jehovah is. He says, who are you? Who shall I tell them that you are? Well, it would seem perfectly clear that if Moses was a Hebrew and not from Egypt, he would know exactly who Jehovah was, but he didn't. He'd not heard of this, this God. The reply was, I am that I am. So we're told. And I am that I am, phonetically in Hebrew, became Jehovah. So, Moses has now met with Jehovah, they're on the mountain, but there is a secrecy about this name. For the longest time, the Israelites and Jews and Hebrews generally were not allowed to mention this name. You couldn't say Jehovah, it was an offense. But, this guy was going to emerge as their new God. So they had to say prayers to him. So they had prayers, they didn't have to write so many new prayers. Most of the prayers that appear in that period of Israelite history were, were Egyptian. They were just translated differently. But they had to tell this God figure that these were prayers to him. And that what they wanted to say was, you know, through the prayer and end up with his name. That was the standard practice. And at the end you say, Jehovah. But they weren't allowed to. They were stuck absolutely with the state God of Egypt. The only name they were allowed to mention at the end of prayers was the state god of Egypt, and that god's name was Amen. <laughs> we have, for hundreds and hundreds of years, all been reciting prayers to the state god of ancient Egypt. <laughs> The word Amen meant hidden, it meant concealed, it meant occult, it meant secret, it meant something beyond you. 
comprehension or view, hidden, concealed, amen. This was deemed pertinent to the name Jehovah because Jehovah was hidden. You couldn't say it. It was, it was concealed, so it was absolutely perfect. And it wasn't until much, much later times, we're moving to the time of Jesus and beyond, when suddenly the, the theologians of the time began to question it. And they said, why, why is it? You know, we keep, amen, why, why aren't these to God? Why aren't these prayers to Jehovah? So, in fact, they, they came up with an explanation, which is, in fact, still given in dictionaries today. They found an old Mesopotamian word, which they figured was pretty similar. It's not similar at all. It's Hayam. Hayam, an old Mesopotamian word, and that meant, so be it. So they said, Amen was the same as Hayam, and it meant, so be it. So they got around the problem, but in fact, we have, as I said, been praying to the state god of Egypt for hundreds of years, so... <laughs> Maybe that's why it doesn't work. <laughs> the Ten Commandments. This is the big thing, isn't it, of the mountain? The story of the Ten Commandments. There is and was absolutely nothing new about the Ten Commandments at all. Looking through the old documentation, I found in the Egyptian Book of the Dead something called Spell Number 125. <laughs> thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness. They're there. The Ten Commandments are part of the Egyptian Spell Number 125. So this is rather odd, isn't it? They've gone to this new land, they have this new god that they're going to follow, but they can't call him by his name, they've got to still use the old name. They're going to have some new laws given to them, but these laws will be the same laws that they called spell number 125. So nothing very much has, has changed. Some, something has to be different. Just on the subject of spells and commandments, it's very, very interesting to note that when you go through the Old Testament, this Egyptian history crops up all the time, word for word, almost. Psalms, the book of Psalms, attributed to King David, the Psalms of King David. These are almost verbatim Egyptian hymns with the insertion of a few new words here and there. The Proverbs of Solomon. There is a whole book in the Old Testament called the Proverbs of Solomon. They're wise things, you know, the sayings of the wise, they call them. The Proverbs of Solomon are, again, word for word, practically verbatim from something called the wisdom of Amenemop, ancient Egypt. Amenemop's papers were actually taken from something called the wisdom of Tarhotep, which came from two and a half thousand years before the time of Solomon. The book of the Proverbs of Solomon is Egyptian. The Ten Commandments are Egyptian. The Psalms were Egyptian. The prayers and the early hymns were Egyptian. So what actually happened here is a story of Israelites coming back into their, the land of their Hebrew cousins. The story is given to us as if they're giving a whole new set of laws and ordinances to bring them into the wrap of this new domain, but in actual fact it's quite the reverse. Moses is bringing them in and saying, this is the Egyptian way. You're going to do it our way from now on. Pyramid texts, coffin texts, wisdom of Tarhotep, all of these things were very apparent in constructing the Old Testament. There, in fact, was very little Judaic law. It was nearly all Egyptian law or Canaanite law. I made the point in... Um, bloodline of the Holy Grail, that the Christian church was a hybrid. It was contrived out of various doctrines sort of pulled together to make a new state type religion. Well, in actual fact, it transpires that exactly that happened with the Old Testament and, and the early Hebrew faith as well. Exactly the same thing. They just wanted to build up a new religion in a foreign land and use the laws and ordinances of one country and move them to another. What's interesting is that when we go through the Old Testament and it tells us that Noah conversed with Jehovah and Abraham had these experiences and whatever, it becomes increasingly clear that the movement towards the one God concept in the Hebrew structure 
didn't happen in the time of Noah, it didn't happen in the time of Abraham, it didn't happen in the time of Moses. It didn't actually happen until about 600 BC. And if we read the Bible again with that in mind, it's not surprising that we keep finding the names of all of these other gods and goddesses. They're everywhere in the Old Testament. There isn't just one god there, they're trying to follow one god, but the other gods are always there and getting in the way, and the plural is used all the time, and they call these gods the Elohim. Through all the years of captivity that the Jews were putting together this Old Testament in Babylon in 5600 BC, the books of the Old Testament were all sorts of individual documents written by different people for different reasons. They weren't one collated book. Even at the time of Jesus, Jesus would never ever have heard of the Old Testament or the Bible. It did not exist. There were various documents. It wasn't until much later that these were collated. And the version, the collated version that we have today comes from the 10th century. But, as with the New Testament, what about all the books that weren't included? How come that they chose these ones and didn't choose those ones? Is there perhaps something in these that we weren't supposed to know? Well, it turns out that there is. There's quite a lot. The Bible actually gives us the names of some of the books. It goes to great lengths to tell us of the importance of the book of the wars of Jehovah, of the great importance of the book of the Lord, of the great importance of the book of Jasher. All of these things, it's said, are really important to our history, but they're not in the Bible. Why were they not included? This is interesting stuff. We need to have a look at them to see what was there. Book of Jasher, here's a good one. Who the hell was Jasher? Well, Jasher, it turns out, was the Egyptian-born son of a chap called Caleb. He was the brother-in-law to the first Israelite judge, Othniel, and he was the appointed royal staff-bearer to Moses. So Jasher, who is pretty close to Moses, he's his staff-bearer at the time, has a book either written by him within his time or written later and attributed to him, missed out of the Bible. Does it then tell us something different about what went on at the time? Does it give us a different story about the Exodus and the affairs at Mount Sinai? Yes, enormously different. Jasher, the experts say, should come between the books of Deuteronomy and and Joshua. It's not there. But Exodus simply tells us that Jehovah issued all of his instructions to Moses on the mountain. Instructions concerning masters and servants and covetousness and neighborly behavior and all of these things. But in the book of Jasher, these things are not conveyed to Moses by Jehovah at all. They're conveyed by a fellow called Jethro. Jethro, it tells us, is the Lord of the Mountain. Lord of the Mountain, in Hebrew, was El Shaddai. And this is particularly important, because when Moses is on the mountain for the first time, meeting with Jehovah, who says, I am that I am, and he says, who are you? He says, I am that I am. I am the one that Abraham used to call El Shaddai. What he's really saying is, you're talking to Jethro, the Lord of the mountain. El Shaddai is recorded in Mesopotamian texts, Lord of the mountain, as being the ultimate leader of the Vulcans. The Vulcans were the master craftsmen, and the Vulcans made the Shamana at the furnaces. So there's a big link here between this guy. You know, Jethro is so important to this as the lord of the mountain, as the mountain in charge of this temple, that he has to be left out. Because if we realize that the, the person giving out these laws and ordinances on the mountain was simply Jethro, the lord of the mountain, the whole of Moses and Jehovah story disappears doesn't exist in the way that we're told it at all. There is no mention in the whole of the book of Jasher in that sequence of Jehovah. Only mentioned is Jethro. Moses even marries the daughter of Jethro. Very important that he does that. So, now if we know that the 
Ten Commandments are not new laws and that they're just simply the Egyptian spell 125 rehashed. What about the other bit of the package? Because there's something really important here within this story. There is something called the Tables of Testimony that get passed to Moses by Jethro or Jehovah at that time. The Tables of Testimony. Now the Tables of Testimony are said within all of the teaching of that time in documents outside of the Bible, which wasn't written until much later, to have been teachings held within a sacred stone. And this sacred stone was said to have been placed in the palm of Moses' hand. They called it the sacred sapphire. They called it the sacred emerald. By whatever title, this thing seems like a gemstone that could be held within the palm of Moses' hand and held, it was said, all the secrets that man has ever known and many of the things that he will know. Now, that's not the image that we get, is it? The, the, the image that we get of the tables of testimony is, is this, the finger of Jehovah blasting these words onto great granite slabs. <laughs> and it's the word stone. The moment the word stone is, is mentioned, we all have our own image. And MGM have decided the image that we're going to stick with, and it's great <laughs> granite slabs that you can't even carry. However, where it goes wrong in most of the portrayals is that these slabs contain the Ten Commandments, and that's not even what the Bible tells us. The Ten Commandments were quite separate, different thing altogether. What was on the stone, and it's a single stone in the old books, was the tables of testimony. Now, this is just a throwaway, because I, I, I have no proof of this at all, but it just struck me that we ought really to look at emeralds sapphires and amethysts. These are the stones that are mentioned. These, these are the stones that were said in ancient Mesopotamia, in the time of Moses, even in the time of King Solomon, to be the stones that hold all the information that was important that man has ever known and much that he will know. So I thought, I'm going to get a few scientists on this and just see what these stones are made of. You know, what's the, what's the key to these stones? Well, these stones are based on a beryl silica. The silicate that they're made of is pretty much the same throughout. And it turns out that this silica is identical to the silicate that Pentium use in their modern computer chips. So it means nothing. It's just a thought to toss around in your mind, but it's interesting, isn't it? 